Track 35. The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Read by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. Track 35. The Story Continued by Walter Hartwright. 5. The last notes of the introduction to the opera were being played, and the seats in the pit were all filled when Pesco and I reached the theatre. There was plenty of room, however, in the passage that ran round the pit, precisely the position best calculated to answer the purpose for which I was attending the performance. I went first to the barrier separating us from the stalls, and looked for the Count in that part of the theatre. He was not there. Returning along the passage on the left-hand side from the stage, and looking about me attentively, I discovered him in the pit. He occupied an excellent place, some twelve or fourteen seats from the end of a bench, within three rows of the stalls. I placed myself exactly on a line with him. Pesca standing by my side. The professor was not yet aware of the purpose for which I had brought him to the theatre, and he was rather surprised that we did not move nearer to the stage. The curtain rose, and the opera began. Throughout the whole of the first act we remained in our position, the Count absorbed by the orchestra and the stage, never casting so much as a chance glance at us. Not a note of Donizetti's delicious music was lost on him. There he sat, high above his neighbours, smiling and nodding his great head, enjoyingly from time to time. When the people near him applauded at the close of an air, as an English audience in such circumstances always will applaud, without the least consideration for the orchestral movement which immediately followed it, he looked around at them with an expression of compassionate remonstrance, and held up one hand with a gesture of polite entreaty. At the more refined passages of the singing, at the more delicate phrases of the music, which passed unapplauded by others, his fat hands adorned with perfectly fitting black kid gloves, softly patted each other, in token of the cultivated appreciation of a musical man. At such times his oily murmur of approval, Bravo! Bra! hummed through the silence, like the purring of a great cat. His immediate neighbours on either side, hearty ruddy-faced people from the country, basking amazedly in the sunshine of fashionable London, seeing and hearing him began to follow his lead. Many a burst of applause from the pit that night started from the soft, comfortable patting of the black-gloved hands. The man's voracious vanity devoured this implied tribute to his local and critical supremacy with an appearance of the highest relish. Smiles rippled continuously over his fat face. He looked about him at the pauses in the music, serenely satisfied with himself and his fellow creatures. Yes, yes, these barbarous English people are learning something from me. Here, there, and everywhere, I, Fosco, am an influence that is felt, a man who sits supreme. If ever a face spoke, his face spoke then, and that was its language. The curtain fell on the first act, and the audience rose to look about them. This was the time I had waited for, the time to try if Pesca knew him. He rose with the rest, and surveyed the occupants of the boxes grandly with his opera-glass. At first his back was turned towards us, but he turned round in time to our side of the theatre, and looked at the boxes above us, using his glass for a few minutes, then removing it, but still continuing to look up. This was the moment I chose, when his full face was in view, for directing Pesca's attention to him. "'Do you know that man?' I asked. "'Which man, my friend?' The tall fat man, standing there with his face towards us. Pesca raised himself on tiptoe, and looked at the Count. "'No,' said the Professor. "'The big fat man is a stranger to me. Is he famous? Why do you point him out?' "'Because I have particular reasons for wishing to know something of him. He is a countryman of yours. His name is Count Fosco. Do you know that name?' <laughs> "'Not I, Walter. Neither the name nor the man is known to me.' "'You're quite sure you don't recognize him? Look again. Look carefully.' I'll tell you why I'm so anxious about it when we leave the theatre. Stop. Let me help you up here, where you can see him better. 
I helped the little man to perch himself on the edge of the raised dais upon which the pit seats are placed. His small stature was no hindrance to him. Here he could see over the heads of the ladies who were seated near the outermost part of the bench. A slim, light-haired man standing by us, whom I had not noticed before, a man with a scar on his left cheek, looked attentively at Pesca as I helped him up, and then looked still more attentively, following the direction of Pesca's eyes at the Count. Our conversation might have reached his ears, and might, as it struck me, have roused his curiosity. Meanwhile, Pesca fixed his eyes earnestly on the broad, full, smiling face turned a little upwards exactly opposite to him. No, he said, I've never set my two eyes on that big fat man before in all my life. As he spoke, the Count looked downwards towards the boxes behind us on the pit tier. The eyes of the two Italians met. The instant before, I had been perfectly satisfied from his own reiterated assertion that Pesca did not know the Count. The instant afterwards I was equally certain that the Count knew Pesca. Knew him, and, more surprising still, feared him as well. There was no mistaking the change that passed over the villain's face, the leaden hue that altered his yellow complexion in a moment, the sudden rigidity in all his features, the furtive scrutiny of his cold grey eyes. The motionless stillness of him from head to foot told their own tale. A mortal dread had mastered him, body and soul, and his own recognition of Pesca was the cause of it. The slim man with the scar on his cheek was still close by us. He had apparently drawn his influence from the effect produced on the Count by the sight of Pesca, as I had drawn mine. He was a mild, gentlemanlike man, looking like a foreigner, and his interest in our proceedings was not expressed in anything approaching to an offensive manner. For my own part, I was so startled by the change in the Count's face, so astonished at the entirely unexpected turn which events had taken, that I knew neither what to say or do next. Pesca roused me by stepping back to his former place at my side and speaking first. "'How the fat man stares!' he exclaimed. "'Is it at me? Am I famous? How can he know me when I don't know him?' I kept my eyes still on the Count, and I saw him move for the first time when Pesca moved so as not to lose sight of the little man in the lower position in which he now stood. I was curious to see what would happen if Pesca's attention under these circumstances was withdrawn from him, and I accordingly asked the professor if he recognized any of his pupils that evening among the ladies in the boxes. Pesca immediately raised the large opera glass to his eyes, and moved it slowly all around the upper part of the theatre, searching for his pupils with the most conscientious scrutiny. The moment he showed himself to be thus engaged, the Count turned round, slipped past the persons who occupied the seats on the further side of him from where we stood, disappeared in the middle passage down the centre of the pit. I caught Pesca by the arm, and, to his inexpressible astonishment, hurried him round with me to the back of the pit to intercept the Count before he could get to the door. Somewhat to my surprise, the slim man hastened out before us. Avoiding a stoppage caused by some people on our side of the pit leaving their places, by which Pesca and myself were delayed. When we reached the lobby, the counter disappeared, and the foreigner with the scar was gone too. "'Come home,' I said. "'Come home, Pesca, to your lodgings. I must speak to you in private. I must speak directly.' "'My soul, bless my soul!' cried the Professor, in a state of the extremest bewilderment. "'What on earth is the matter?' I walked on rapidly without answering. The circumstances under which the Count had left the theatre suggested to me that his extraordinary anxiety to escape Pesca might carry him to further extremities still. He might escape me, too, by leaving London. I doubted the future if I allowed him so much as a day's freedom to act as he pleased, and I doubted that foreign stranger, who had got the start of us, and whom I suspected of intentionally following him out. With this double distrust in my mind, I was not long in making Pesca understand what I wanted. As soon as we two were alone in his room, I increased his confusion and amazement a hundredfold by telling him what my purpose was as plainly and unreservedly as I have acknowledged it here. "'My friend, what can I do?' cried the Professor, piteously appealing to me with both hands. "'Deuce what the deuce! How can I help you, Walter, when I don't know the man?' "'He knows you. He's afraid of you. He's left the theatre to escape you. Pesca, there must be a reason for this.' Look back into your own life before you came to England. 
you left Italy, as you have told me yourself, for political reasons. You have never mentioned those reasons to me, and I don't inquire into them now. I only ask you to consult your own recollections, and to say if they suggest no past cause for the terror which the first sight of you produced in that man." To my unutterable surprise, these words, harmless as they appeared to me, produced the same astounding effect on Pesca which the sight of Pesca had produced on the Count. The rosy face of my little friend whitened in an instant, and he drew back from me slowly, trembling from head to foot. Walter, he said, you don't know what you ask. He spoke in a whisper. He looked at me as if I had suddenly revealed to him some hidden danger to both of us. In less than one minute of time he was so altered from the easy, lively, quaint little man of all my past experience, that if I had met him in the street, changed as I saw him now, I should most certainly not have known him again. "'Forgive me if I have unintentionally pained and shocked you,' I replied. "'Remember the cruel wrong my wife has suffered at Count Fosco's hands. Remember that the wrong can never be redressed unless the means are in my power of forcing him to do her justice. I spoke in her interests, Pesca, and I ask you again to forgive me. I can say no more." I rose to go. He stopped me before I reached the door. "'Wait,' he said. "'You've shaken me from head to foot. You don't know how I left my country, and why I left my country. Let me compose myself. Let me think, if I can.' I returned to my chair. He walked up and down the room, talking to himself incoherently in his own language. After several turns, backwards and forwards, he suddenly came up to me, and laid his little hands, with a strange tenderness and solemnity, on my breast. "'On my heart and soul, Walter,' he said, "'is there no other way to get to that man but the chance way through me?' "'There's no other way,' I answered. He left me again, opened the door of the room, and looked out cautiously into the passage, closed it once more, and came back. You won your right over me, Walter, on the day when you saved my life. It was yours from that moment, when you pleased to take it. Take it now. Yes, I mean what I say. My next words, as true as the good God is above us, will put my life into your hands." The trembling earnestness with which he uttered this extraordinary warning carried with it to my mind the conviction that he spoke the truth. Mind this, he went on shaking his hands at me in the vehemence of his agitation. I hold no thread in my own mind between that man Fosco and the past time which I call back to me for your sake. If you find the thread, keep it to yourself. Tell me nothing. On my knees I beg and pray. Let me be ignorant, let me be innocent, let me be blind to all the future as I am now." He said a few words more, hesitatingly and disconnectedly, then stopped again. I saw that the effort of expressing himself in English, on an occasion too serious to permit him to use the quaint turns and phrases of his ordinary vocabulary, was painfully increasing the difficulty he had felt from the first in speaking to me at all. Having learned to read and understand his native language, though not to speak it, in the earliest days of our intimate companionship, I now suggested to him that he should express himself in Italian, while I used English in putting any questions which might be necessary to my enlightenment. He accepted the proposal, in his smooth-flowing language, spoken with a vehement agitation which betrayed itself in the perpetual working of his features, in the wildness and the suddenness of his foreign gesticulations, but never in raising of his voice. I now heard the words which armed me to meet that last struggle that is left for this story to record. It is only right to mention here that I repeat Pesco's statement to me with the careful suppressions and alterations which the serious nature of the subject and my own sense of duty to my friend demand. My first and last concealments from the reader are those which caution renders absolutely necessary in this portion of the narrative. "'You know nothing of my motive for leaving Italy,' he began, except that it was for political reasons. If I had been driven to this country by the persecution of my government, I should not have kept those reasons a secret from you or from any one. I have concealed them because no government authority has pronounced the sentence of my exile. You have heard, Walter, of the political societies that are hidden in every great city on the continent of Europe? To one of those societies I belonged in Italy, and belong still in England. When I came to this country I came by the direction of my chief. 
I was overzealous in my younger time. I ran the risk of compromising myself and others. For those reasons I was ordered to emigrate to England and to wait. I emigrated. I have waited. I wait still. Tomorrow I may be called away. Ten years hence I may be called away. It's all one to me. I'm here, I support myself by teaching, and I wait. I violate no oath, you shall hear why presently, in making my confidence complete by telling you the name of the society to which I belong. All I do is put my life in your hands. If what I say to you now is ever known by others to have passed my lips, as certainly as we two sit here, I am a dead man. He whispered the next words in my ear. I keep the secret which he thus communicated. The society to which he belonged will be sufficiently individualized for the purposes of these pages, if I call it the Brotherhood, on the few occasions when any reference to the subject will be needed in this place. The object of the Brotherhood, Pesca went on, is, briefly, the object of other political societies of the same sort, the destruction of tyranny and the assertion of the rights of the people. The principles of the Brotherhood are two. As long as a man's life is useful, or even harmless only, he has the right to enjoy it. But if his life inflicts injury on the well-being of his fellow men, from that moment he forfeits the right, and it is not only no crime but a positive merit to deprive him of it. It's not for me to say in what frightful circumstances of oppression and suffering this society took its rise. It is not for you to say, you Englishmen, who have conquered your freedom so long ago, that you have conveniently forgotten what blood you shed, and what extremities you proceeded to in the conquering. It is not for you to say, how far the worst of all exasperations may or may not carry the maddened men of an enslaved nation. The iron that has entered into our souls has gone too deep for you to find it. Leave the refugee alone. Laugh at him. Distrust him. Open your eyes in wonder at that secret self which smoulders in him, sometimes under the everyday respectability and tranquillity of a man like me, sometimes under the grinding poverty, the fierce squalor of men less lucky, less pliable, less patient than I am. But judge us not. In the time of your first Charles you might have done us justice. The long luxury of your own freedom has made you incapable of doing us justice now. All the deepest feelings of his nature seemed to force themselves to the surface in those words. All his heart was poured out to me for the first time in our lives, but still his voice never rose. Still his dread of the terrible revelation he was making to me never left him. So far, he resumed, you think the society like other societies. Its object, in your English opinion, is anarchy and revolution. It takes the life of the bad king and the bad minister, as if the one and the other were dangerous wild beasts to be shot at the first opportunity. I grant you this, but the laws of the Brotherhood are the laws of no other political society on the face of the earth. The members are not known to one another. There is a president in Italy, there are presidents abroad. Each of these has his secretary. The presidents and secretaries know the members, but the members among themselves are all strangers. Until their chiefs see fit, in the political necessity of the time, or in the private necessity of the society, to make them known to each other. With such a safeguard as this there is no oath among us on admittance. We are identified with the Brotherhood by a secret mark which we all bear, and which lasts while our lives last. We are told to go about our ordinary business, and to report ourselves to the President or the Secretary four times a year. In the event of our services being required, we are warned if we betray the Brotherhood, or if we injure it by serving other interests, that we die by the principles of the Brotherhood, die by the hand of a stranger who may be sent from the other end of the world to strike the blow, or by the hand of our own bosom friend, who may have been a member unbeknown to us through all the years of our intimacy. Sometimes the death is delayed, sometimes it follows close on the treachery. It is our first business to know how to wait our second business to know how to obey when the word is spoken. Some of us may wait our lives through, and not be wanted. Some of us may be called to the work, or to the preparation for the work, the very day of our admission. I myself, 
the little easy cheerful man you know who of his own accord would hardly lift up his handkerchief to strike down the fly that buzzes around his face i in my younger time under provocation so dreadful that i will not tell you of it entered the brotherhood by an impulse as i might have killed myself by an impulse i must remain in it now it has got me whatever i may think of it in my better circumstances and my cooler manhood to my dying day while i was still in italy i was chosen secretary and all the members of that time who were brought face to face with my president were brought face to face also with me i began to understand him i saw the end towards which his extraordinary disclosure was now tending he waited a moment watching me earnestly watching till he had evidently guessed what was passing in my mind before he resumed you have drawn your own conclusion already he said i see it in your face tell me nothing keep me out of the secret of your thoughts let me make one last sacrifice of myself for your sake and then have done with this subject never to return to it again he signed to me not to answer him rose removed his coat and rolled up his shirt-sleeve on his left arm i promised you that this confidence would be complete he whispered speaking close at my ear with his eyes looking watchfully at the door whatever comes of it you shall not reproach me with having hidden anything from you which it was necessary to your interests to know i have said that the brotherhood identifies its members by a mark which lasts for life see the place and the mark on it for yourself he raised his bare arm and showed me high on the upper part of it and in the inner side a brand deeply burnt in the flesh and stained of a bright blood-red colour i abstain from describing the device which the brand represented it will be sufficient to say that it was circular in form and so small that it would have been completely covered by a shilling coin a man who has this mark branded in this place he said covering his arm again is a member of the brotherhood a man who has been false to the brotherhood is discovered sooner or later by the chiefs who know him presidents or secretaries as the case may be and a man discovered by the chiefs is dead no human laws can protect him remember what you have seen and heard draw what conclusions you like act as you please but in the name of God whatever you discover whatever you do tell me nothing let me remain free from a responsibility which it horrifies me to think of which I know in my conscience is not my responsibility now for the last time I say it on my honor as a gentleman on my oath as a Christian if the man you pointed out at the opera knows me he is so altered or so disguised that I do not know him I am ignorant of his proceedings or his purposes in England I never saw him I never heard the name he goes by, to my knowledge, before to-night. I say no more. Leave me a little, Walter. I am overpowered by what has happened. I am shaken by what I have said. Let me try to be like myself again when we next meet. He dropped into a chair, and, turning away from me, hid his face in his hands. I gently opened the door so as not to disturb him, and spoke my few parting words in low tones which he might hear or not as he pleased I will keep the memory of tonight in my heart of hearts I said you shall never repent the trust you have reposed in me may I come to you tomorrow may I come as early as nine o'clock yes Walter he replied looking up at me kindly and speaking in English once more as if his one anxiety now was to get back to our former relations towards each other come to my little bit of breakfast before I go my ways among the pupils that I teach. Good night, Pesca. Good night, my friend. 6. My first conviction, as soon as I found myself outside the house, was that no alternative was left to me but to act at once on the information I had received, to make sure of the count that night, or to risk the loss if I only delayed till the morning of Laura's last chance. I looked at my watch. It was ten o'clock. Not the shadow of a doubt crossed my mind of the purpose for which the Count had left the theatre. His escape from us that evening 
was beyond all question the preliminary only to his escape from London. The mark of the Brotherhood was on his arm. I felt as certain of it as if he had shown me the brand. And the betrayal of the Brotherhood was on his conscience. I had seen it in his recognition of Pesca. It was easy to understand why that recognition had not been mutual. A man of the Count's character would never risk the terrible consequences of turning spy without looking to his personal security quite as carefully as he looked to his golden reward. The shaven face, which I had pointed out at the opera, might have been covered by a beard in Pesca's time. His dark brown hair might be a wig. His name was evidently a false one. The accident of time might have helped him as well. His immense corpulence might have come with his later years. There was every reason why Pesca should not have known him again. Every reason also why he should have known Pesca, whose singular personal appearance had made a marked man of him go where he might. I have said that I felt certain of the purpose in the Count's mind when he escaped us at the theatre. How could I doubt it, when I saw with my own eyes that he believed himself, in spite of the change in his appearance, to have been recognised by Pesca, and to be therefore in danger of his life. If I could get speech of him that night, if I could show him that I too knew of the mortal peril in which he stood, what result would follow? Plainly this. One of us must be the master of the situation, one of us must inevitably be at the mercy of the other. I owed it to myself to consider the chances against me before I confronted them. I owed it to my wife to do all that lay in my power to lessen the risk. The chances against me wanted no reckoning up. They were all merged in one. If the Count discovered by my own avowal that the direct way to his safety lay through my life, he was probably the last man in existence who would shrink from throwing me off my guard and taking that way when he had me alone within his reach. The only means of defence against him on which I could at all rely to lessen the risk presented themselves, after a little careful thinking, clearly enough. Before I had made any personal acknowledgment of my discovery in his presence, I must place the discovery itself where it would be ready for instant use against him, and safe from any attempt at suppression on his part. If I laid the mine under his feet before I approached him, and if I left instructions with a third person to fire it on the expiration of a certain time, unless directions to the contrary were previously received under my own hand, or from my own lips. In that event, the Count's security was absolutely dependent upon mine, and I might hold the vantage ground over him securely, even in his own house. This idea occurred to me when I was close to the new lodgings which we had taken on returning from the seaside. I went in without disturbing any one by the help of my key. A light was in the hall, and I stole up with it to my workroom to make my preparations and absolutely commit myself to an interview with the Count before either Laura or Marian could have the slightest suspicion of what I intended to do. A letter addressed to Pesca presented the surest measure of precaution which it was now possible for me to take. I wrote as follows. The man whom I pointed out to you at the opera is a member of the Brotherhood, and has been false to his trust. Put both these assertions to the test instantly. You know the name he goes by in England. His address is number 5 Forest Road, St. John's Wood. On the love you once bore me, use the power entrusted to you without mercy and without delay against that man. I have risked all and lost all, and the forfeit of my failure has been paid with my life. I signed and dated these lines, enclosed them in an envelope, and sealed it up. On the outside I wrote this direction. Keep the enclosure unopened until nine o'clock tomorrow morning. If you do not hear from me or see me before that time, break the seal when the clock strikes and read the contents. I added my initials and protected the whole by enclosing it in a second sealed envelope addressed to Pesca at his lodgings. Nothing remained to be done after this but to find the means of sending my letter to its destination immediately. I should then have accomplished all that lay in my power. If anything happened to me in the Count's house, I had now provided for his answering it with his life. That the means of preventing his escape under any circumstances whatever were at Pesca's disposal if he chose to exert them, I did not for an instant doubt. The extraordinary anxiety which he had expressed to remain unenlightened as to the Count's identity, 
or in other words to be left uncertain enough about facts to justify him to his own conscience in remaining passive betrayed plainly that the means of exercising the terrible justice of the brotherhood were ready to his hand although as a naturally humane man he had shrunk from plainly saying as much in my presence the deadly certainty which the vengeance of foreign political societies can hunt down a traitor to the cause hide himself where he may has been too often exemplified even in my superficial experience to allow any doubt considering the subject only as a reader of newspapers cases recurred to my memory both in london and in paris of foreigners found stabbed in the streets whose assassins could never be traced of bodies and parts of bodies thrown into the thames and the seine by hands that could never be discovered of deaths by secret violence which could only be accounted for in one way I have disguised nothing relating to myself in these pages, and I do not disguise here that I believed I had written Count Fosco's death warrant, if the fatal emergency happened which authorized Pesca to open my enclosure. I left my room to go down to the ground floor of the house, and speak to the landlord about finding me a messenger. He happened to be ascending the stairs at the time, and we met on the landing. His son, a quick lad, was the messenger he proposed to me on hearing what I wanted. We had the boy upstairs, and I gave him his directions. He was to take the letter in a cab, to put it into Professor Pesca's own hands, and to bring me back a line of acknowledgment from that gentleman, returning in the cab, and keeping it at the door for my use. It was then nearly half-past ten. I calculated that the boy might be back in twenty minutes, and that I might drive to St. John's Wood on his return in twenty minutes more. When the lad had departed on his errand, I returned to my own room for a little while, to put certain papers in order, so that they might be easily found in the case of the worst. The key of the old-fashioned bureau in which the papers were kept I sealed up, and I left it on my table with Marian's name written on the outside of the little packet. This done I went downstairs to the sitting-room, in which I expected to find Laura and Marian awaiting my return from the opera. I felt my hand trembling for the first time when I laid it on the lock of the door. No one was in the room but Marian. She was reading, and she looked at her watch in surprise as I came in. "'How early you are back!' she said. "'You must have come away before the opera was over.' "'Yes,' I replied. "'Neither Pesca nor I waited for the end. Where is Laura?' She had one of her bad headaches this evening, and I advised her to go to bed when we had done tea. I left the room again, on the pretext of wishing to see whether Laura was asleep. Marian's quick eyes were beginning to look inquiringly at my face. Marian's quick instinct was beginning to discover that I had something weighing on my mind. When I entered the bedchamber, and softly approached the bedside by the dim flicker of the nightlight, my wife was asleep. We had not been married quite a month yet. If my heart was heavy, if my resolution for a moment faltered again, when I looked at her face turned faithfully to my pillow in her sleep, when I saw her hand resting open on the coverlid, as if it was waiting unconsciously for mine, surely there was some excuse for me. I only allowed myself a few minutes to kneel down at the bedside and to look close at her, so close that her breath as it came and went fluttered on my face. I only touched her hand and her cheek with my lips at parting. She stirred in her sleep and muttered my name, but without waking. I lingered for an instant at the door, to look at her again. "'God bless you, and keep you, my darling,' I whispered, and left her. Marian was at the stairhead waiting for me. She had a folded slip of paper in her hand. "'The landlord's son has brought this for you,' she said. "'He has got a cab at the door. He says you ordered him to keep it at your disposal. Quite right, Marian. I want the cab. I'm going out again. I descended the stairs as I spoke, and looked into the sitting-room, to read the slip of paper by the light on the table. It contained these two sentences in Pesca's handwriting. Your letter is received. If I don't see you before the time you mention, I will break the seal when the clock strikes. I placed the paper in my pocket-book, and made for the door. Marian met me on the threshold, and pushed me back into the room where the candlelight fell full on my face. She held me by both hands, and her eyes fastened searchingly 
on mine. I see, she said, in a low, eager whisper. You're trying the last chance tonight. Yes, the last chance and the best, I whispered back. Not alone. Oh, Walt, for God's sake, not alone. Let me go with you. Don't refuse me, because I'm only a woman. I must go. I will go. I'll wait outside in the cab. It was my turn to hold her. She tried to break away from me and to get down first to the door. If you want to help me, I said, stop here and sleep in my wife's room tonight. Only let me go away with my mind easy about Laura, and I answer for everything else. Come, Marion, give me a kiss and show that you have the courage to wait until I come back. I dared not allow her time to say a word more. She tried to hold me again. I unclasped her hands and was out of the room in a moment. The boy below heard me on the stairs and opened the hall door. I jumped into the cab before the driver could get off the box. Forest Road, St. John's Wood, I called to him through the front window. Double fare if you get there in a quarter of an hour. I'll do it, sir. I looked at my watch. Eleven o'clock. Not a minute to lose. The rapid motion of the cab, the sense that every instant was now bringing me nearer to the Count, the conviction that I was embarked at last without let or hindrance on my hazardous enterprise heated me into such a fever of excitement that I shouted to the man to go faster and faster. As we left the streets and crossed St. John's Wood Road, my impatience so completely overpowered me that I stood up in the cab and stretched my head out of the window to see the end of the journey before we reached it. Just as the church clock in the distance struck the quarter past, we turned into Forest Road. I stopped the driver a little way from the Count's house, paid and dismissed him, and walked on to the door. As I approached the garden gate, I saw another person advancing towards it also from the direction opposite to mine. We met under the gas lamp in the road, and looked at each other. I instantly recognized the light-haired foreigner from the scar on his cheek, and I thought he recognized me. He said nothing, and instead of stopping at the house as I did, he slowly walked on. Or had he followed the Count home from the opera? I did not pursue those questions after waiting a little till the foreigner had slowly passed out of sight, I rang the gate bell. It was then twenty minutes past eleven, late enough to make it quite easy for the Count to get rid of me by the excuse that he was in bed. The only way of providing against this contingency was to send him in my name without asking any preliminary questions, and to let him know at the same time that I had a serious motive for wishing to see him at that late hour. Accordingly, while I was waiting, I took out my card and wrote under my name, On Important Business. The maid-servant answered the door while I was writing the last word in pencil, and asked me distrustfully what I pleased to want. Be so good as to take that to your master, I replied, giving her the card. I saw by the girl's hesitation of manner that if I had asked for the Count in the first instance, she would only have followed her instructions by telling me he was not at home. She was staggered by the confidence with which I gave her the card. After staring at me in great perturbation, she went back into the house with my message, closing the door, and leaving me to wait in the garden. In a minute or so she reappeared. Her master's compliments, and would I be so obliging as to say what my business was? Take my compliments back, I replied, and say that my business cannot be mentioned to any one but your master. She left me again, and again returned and this time asked me to walk in. I followed her at once. In another moment I was inside the Count's house. End of track 35